Nice trailer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning, bonjour à tous, salamat pagi, buenas tardes, hello. So I want to talk to you today about something very interesting. You know, I, I've been looking at the turf of sustainability for a long time, and five years ago, people started asking me about how technology will be humanly sustainable. In other words, when we're, when we're constantly connecting on 5G networks with augmented reality and brain-computer interfaces, are we still human? Is that su sustainable? So I wrote a book on this, Technology vs. Humanity. It's available in 10 languages. I have a couple of free copies with me. But basically, uh, in this world, you know, this is really what I do as a futurist. I, I don't predict the future, I observe the future. I think it's become very important in the last few years because God knows we're living in a crazy time. Every week there's a new innovation coming up. I always say science fiction is becoming science fact. Language control, voice computing with the computer, so-called conversational computing, thinking machines, artificial intelligence, flying drones, drone taxis. The future is no longer about tomorrow. The future is here. We just haven't paid attention. The future is now a mindset. And I think if you're working on sustainability, we're talking about you know, circular thinking, the mindset has to be futuristic. And we're talking about not 50 years, you know, five years. That is a very important point. When we look at the future, we get this a lot. I don't know what your feeling is about the future, but in the last three or four years, most people are worried about the future. And it's not just climate change. Now, there's a few other topics, politics, which I won't touch because you know, it will take a long time. Right? But the other one is robots, machines, intelligent computers. First, they will take our jobs, and then they will kill us. Right? That's, the, that's the message. So we're not going to have a, a nice planet. We're not going to have any work. We're not going to be you know, fulfilled by our work. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that I think the future is better than we think. I mean, the things that we have achieved with technology and, of course, without, uh, are quite mind-boggling. Just on a practical level, think about this. If you have kids in other countries, now you can use WhatsApp to make free phone calls. Ten years ago, it would have been, I know, two francs a minute here from Switzerland to call somebody in Indonesia. So now it's free. Now music is 10 euros for 21 million songs. And the list goes on. So I'm going to give you a wildly optimistic view of the future. In the next 20 years, we're going to see this because of science and technology. We're going to address food shortages. We're going to stop or even reverse global warming. That is wildly optimistic. Right? <laughs> We're going to look at diseases, genetic engineering, desalination of water. Technology will be there, just like it is there now for so many things. The only thing that we have to do here, and this is wildly pessimistic, we have to govern it wisely. We have to govern technology wisely and science. Because now we're inventing things that can be both heaven and hell, like any technology, really. Look at, uh, for example, artificial intelligence, the idea of thinking machines, the idea of genetic engineering of humans, geoengineering the weather. Sounds like science fiction? is not. You heard about the Chinese doctor, right, three months ago, first operation ever to avoid the kids having HIV, the doctor cut a gene in the germline of the babies. He's in jail now, I think. Maybe some fancy jail, I don't know. But so this is a huge issue, right? If we have to govern wisely, what is the next step? I think our world is going to change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. If you think this is crazy, I think about this, right? Industrial Revolution, World War II, the internet, atomic bomb, all of these things last 300 years. But now, Technology is coming and changing us. When you use the smartphone, it changes the way you think. When you use augmented reality, which is very soon going to be a standard, just like you know, the mobile phone is a standard, y your vision is, your, the way you're thinking is changing. And then your body is changing because now we have nanobots in the bloodstream checking your cholesterol. That's not science fiction, already exists. FTC approved, or FDA, sorry, <laughs> FDA approved uh, technology already exists to change our genes. A, a drug called Cumbria by Novartis, $480,000. We're going to change who we are as humans. And some people are saying, you know, that you, as humans, we're kind of a lame duck, you know, so we, we have to change. <laughs> I don't quite agree, but clearly this is the future. Humans and technology are converging. 
And we have to ask this question, how far do we want to go? How sustainable would it be if we become superhuman? I mean, who, who in this room does not want to be superhuman? I think there are a few. But if I ask a question in California, nah. <laughs> Silicon Valley, nah, we, all want to, we want to be superhuman. Of course we want to be superhuman. And of course, you know, have a super amount of fun. But in this handshake between technology and humanity, the question for me is, are we sometimes confusing the purpose, which is humanity, with the tool? Take Facebook, social media. Most of you are probably on Facebook, right? <laughs> Facebook is distorting the mean, mean, meaning of friendship because Facebook is an AI, right? Facebook is an algorithm that feeds you back what keeps you there the longest. It has no intent whatsoever to, to actually furnish a real conversation. It does that by accident sometimes. Yeah? Facebook has become the purpose of life for a lot of people. Right? And that's kind of the reverse, the technology is not sustainable. Look at the growth of technology in all different segments. I mean, we're living at the pivot point in history where all the stuff that was science fiction, like energy storage, robotics, genome sequencing, now just boom, exploding. Consider yourself lucky. We're going to solve issues, for example, through uh, lab-grown meat. Right? You think that's a joke? But, you know, uh, Richard Branson and Bill Gates do not. They have invested in lab-grown meat that they sell. Right now, it's about $2,000 a pound, you know, in grown in the lab, but actual meat. They say in 10 years, it'll be one-tenth of regular meat. Would that solve the problem with food? Yeah, probably would contribute to that. <laughs> I'm not sure you want to taste that, but give it a try sometime. Genetic engineering. I don't know, uh, you know, moral or ethical issues, but clearly we're going to be able sooner or later to get everybody in the world to have the, the genome tested. I mean, imagine what that means, that we can actually track where diseases come from. We can prevent, we can predict, and maybe we can change one of these days. I mean, that is a crazy thought. There's already uh, companies in Silicon Valley talking about the end of dying. I think for most Europeans, that would be like, oh, yeah, I'm not so sure that's a good idea, but, you know, it's probably a big business. <laughs> but is it sustainable? Right? So what's happening in our future really is clearly three things here I want to point out first. And we have to think about this. First, the future is exponential. I mean, we're changing at Moore's Law, Metcalfe's Law pace. You know, the next five years will not just be 5, 6, 7, they'll be 8, 16, 32. Uh, they will be combinatorial, which means all the sciences coming together to create new solutions. I mean, look at companies like Airbnb that wouldn't have been possible without all of these things. And then the, in the industries are converging. For example, information technology and healthcare is converging. Companies like Roche and Novartis and other companies that will be, become technology companies. And technology companies will become companies that cover healthcare, like Apple and Amazon and others. So remember those three things, exponential, combinatorial, convergent. And within that lies the key to sustainability. Imagine the things that we can do here if we set our mind to it. Take this formula, EX, combinatorial convergent, and put circular on top. I think that's the answer that we can pull off. I mean, of course, yeah, optimism, yes, but clearly we're going to see here in this sort of game-changing world, these are the eight game changes that I treat in my book, data, the cloud, the Internet of Things, and so on. And these are the companies that make money with those game changers. You know the most powerful companies in the world today? They're not oil and gas, or banking, or even the military. Well, some of those are the same, obviously. <laughs> but who are the most powerful companies in the world? Data companies. Social networks, search engines, media platforms, what's called platformization. The top four companies on this list have more money than the GDP of France. They could buy France, right. just as an idea, you know. <laughs> I mean, mind-boggling how we see this developing. So let me show you this short video to see what these companies are thinking. Of course I remember the code. It's 4452? Four, four, four. This guy looks amazing. I look amazing. I should take a selfie. Did I forget to lock the front door? Hey, Google? Hi, what can I do for you? This is a Google commercial that ran in during the Oscars in the US. And the key message is this, if you don't know what to do, ask Google. 
And we do ask Google all the time, of course, Google Maps and so on. But imagine the, magis, the mad message saying that, you know, we don't have to think anymore. We can just say, I'll, you know, Google, find me a wife or figure out if I can have kids uh, or, you know, how long is Trump going to be president, whatever. We can ask all these questions, right? I'll be a short question, short answer to this, but, <laughs> but here's my point of this. Too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. And we know that with all drugs, of course, right? Right? Technology is kind of a drug. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing, and that's unsustainable for us. I mean, imagine if we lived in a world where everything that we have asked questions for, we're going to ask some machine to tell us. I mean, are we going to still know who we are? Are we going to get out of bed in the morning and say, hey, Google, who the hell am I? Can you tell me what is the purpose of my life? So really what's happening is that we have a second level of sustainability and of pollution. I call that digital pollution. And I'm a biggest polluter myself using it, so I now know very well what it feels like. But what we are seeing today is essentially the side effects of digitization. Loneliness, connectivity problems, right? that we always have to be connected. We put the machine over the human. We, we have more relationships with the screen than we have with people. And this is only the beginning, because technology is still pretty lame, believe me. In the next 10 years, we're going to see a, a, a boost that you would not believe. 5G will allow you to download a movie in one second and be on a virtual conference room in, in, in a hologram somewhere in the middle of the mountains. So here's the bottom line on this. When we look at this, in order to address the unintended consequences, the externalities of technology, we're going to need new ethics, values, public debate, corporate accountability, because this in 10 years will be much, much bigger. Today, it's some of us worried about these things like addiction to cell phones. Eh? In 10 years, it'll just be everywhere. In fact, I think in 10 years, we can live in a virtual world. We don't actually have to really exist right? because we can connect to the internet, to the mobile networks. And, and this becomes a very big discussion. I put forth in my book, the creation of a digital ethics council. Let's call it the digital circular council. Think about the circular economy in, in, in a digital way. I mean, we need this. We don't just need an, a council that talks about digitization and transformation and you know, all of these things that everybody talks about. I mean, digital transformation is the biggest hoax you can imagine. I mean, everything is going to be digital. Right? So anything left is not going to be digital except for the top of Mount Everest, not even there. We need this. And there's a great quote from Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, in Brussels just a little while ago. Technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. That is so true. It's just, you know, it's just a code, it's a robot, it's a machine. It's not conscious, and it shouldn't be. If we want technology to do the right thing, we have to make it do the right thing, just like we're doing with energy and other issues like this. And this is becoming existential. Imagine a machine with an IQ of a million. That is the reality in 25 years. An IQ in terms of processing, not in terms of emotions or so, right? I mean, we're going to move into a really crazy world. So I, I've come up with this new thing that I'm working on. I think our economic system is unfit for this kind of future. Well, it's probably unfit for the kind of presence as well. But four points here, right? People, planet, purpose, prosperity. I think this is the new mantra of the stock market in less than 15 years. And I've been telling the Swiss government to have a stock market like that here, the quadruple bottom line. Because I think that within 20 years, our economic logic will change completely. And when we talk about work, right, this is one of the topics we want to talk about today, we're going to start separating work for money. Basic income has been discussed in Switzerland quite a bit. Right? There's no way around that in the next two decades. And we can fund it, too, because we'll have abundant technology to support it. So this is a real challenge for us. You know, technology doesn't care about our desires. It has no ethics. I mean, it's this code, right? It's binary. Why would it care? But we have to care about ethics and what we want. Simple definition, it's the difference between what you have a right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. Of course, the right thing to do isn't exactly a trivial uh, question. Right? <laughs> I mean, talking about finding an answer to that, right? But now moving into a future that's going from the simple thought of saying, if we're going to do something, how much does it cost? And, you know, does it work? And all these kind of things. Now we're going to why. 
we're doing something. Right? And who? It's becoming a key question. I think we'll see all the initiatives around us. We're moving to the cloud. We're moving to a world where everything is going to be in here. Right? Our healthcare records, our media, our music, everything. And artificial intelligence clearly is moving in this direction. First, sort of trivial existence, you know, intelligent assistance, IA, and then moving into a future where a machine can be generally intelligent. And this last point is like a moratorium waiting to happen. Right? I'm all for machines that can be clever to help us, to assist us, but I'm not for machines that can be like us. I think that sounds like a death wish to me. You know, 20, 30 years, you know, we'll have to deal with that part. So the biggest risk in our near future, and particularly when it's about work, that we may actually gain total control of technology and unlimited power, but we're going to use it wrong. Like we will not distribute the, the po positive benefits. Right? We will not make it accessible. We will not, not, not do the things that we have to do. So I need to come to the end, so I'm going to wrap a little bit quicker here than than I, I wanted to really, but automation is a huge issue, right? When we think about what's happening, that's a much bigger issue than globalization. Routine. I mean, every routine that we know will be done by machines sooner or later. I call this the end of routine. And I think that's terrible for people that only do routine, like there's very few actually, like maybe check out the supermarket, things like that, but driving, not sure. Right? The end of routine is not the end of work. It's just the end of routine. Imagine if you can outsource your routine to a smart machine. Would you feel like you're useless? No, you would feel like you can do other things. The end of the routine is not the end of human work because this is the truth about us as humans. There's a lot more to human intelligence than to a computer. Gardner says research organization roughly eight or nine different types of human intelligence, emotional, social, kinesthetic. What kind of intelligence does a computer have? I mean, if you've seen the movie Her, <laughs> it has only one intelligence, which is computing, processing. And that will be much bigger than we could ever dream of. But does it understand anything? Does it have emotional awareness? Does it have what it takes in the future? I think when we talk about thinking machines, we have to say what my, Paul, my colleague Paul Saffo says, don't mistake a clear view for a short distance. They will come, they are here now, but only on the lowest level. I would have to think about this a little bit different because this is what we do, right? Data and information is not knowledge, is not understanding, is not wisdom, is not purpose, it is just data. Right? And this will be crucial for us to use in the future. So I'll summarize and basically I, I would uh, like to share with you that I think today our biggest challenge is not the machines will kill us or take over the world, is that we become too much like them. We get too lazy to think, right? we rely on, on this, we, we constantly hooked up on it, we forget what we really want because for humans the only thing that matters for humans was mentioned before, trust, relationships, engagement, experiences, you know, like this. Computers are like this. Right? They see this tiny segment and they can calculate forever, but we're like this. So that's, I think, why we make a good match. So, bottom line is our future could be heaven or it could be hell. I am 90% sure today that it will be heaven. Call me an optimist. I think technology-wise, we have all the tools that we need. We just need to agree how to use them. And if, you know, companies in this turf, of course, we have the power to actually change the paradigms. As we can see, that pretty much happened in technology today. We're moving into a future where those two things, you know, the algorithms, technology, and what I call the Android rhythms, the human things, they're going to be equally important. Because these skills that we have as humans, they will never be replaced by machines. At least I don't think it's a good idea to strive for that. I wouldn't want a machine that has you know, imagination or real creativity. So I think that's where we're going, that's what our future is. In a world that's dominated by technology, we must become more human. That to me is the answer to the future of work. We can't beat computers at computing. We're not going to beat computers at doing all those routine works. But we can beat them at being more human. And this is really important when we think about work for education, 
what do our kids have to lear learn in school? Should they learn how to run a spreadsheet, or calculate ROI, or even get an MBA? Or should they just have experiences? Should they be creative? Should they be thinkers? Should they be philosophers? So I really believe that you know, in this game, we have the same cards as ever before. We're just humans. We're not exponential. We need to invest as much in humanity as we do in technology. That's the future of work. That's the future of, of, of our own happiness, I believe. And finally, the statement from my book that we should embrace technology, but not become technology. Because when you are technology, you're a commodity. Thanks very much for listening.